for me? Okay, great. Welcome. Uh, I'm Mark Storsley. I'm the executive director of the Constitutional Law Center. I want to welcome you back for the uh, new year and a bunch of new events coming up the rest of this academic year. Uh, Michael McConnell, the director of the center, uh, will be here. He's caught in traffic, but in the interest of time, uh, he asked me to uh, just welcome you all here and introduce our guest tonight. So our guest is uh, uh, Professor Adam Winkler uh, at UCLA Law School. Uh, Professor Winkler uh, is an expert in a number of sundry issues in constitutional law, uh, including the Second Amendment, but also corporate rights, which he's going to talk about with us tonight. Uh, I mentioned his talk is based on a book uh, that he wrote called We the Corporations uh, that's available online for purchase. Uh, it was also a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, so it's a really important project, really interesting work, and he's going to share some of that uh, with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming Professor Winkler. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And um, I also appreciate the kind of bizarre acoustics where I stand and without a microphone seem to be uh, microphoned all over the place. So uh, I love that. Um, uh, corporations have been at the center of some of the most significant Supreme Court cases of recent years. Um, in 2010, in the Citizens United case, the Supreme Court held that corporations have the same free speech right as individuals and the same right to spend their money on election ads. Uh, some people think that uh, Citizens United could lead to a corporate takeover of American democracy. I think that's just silly. We all know corporations took over American democracy a long time ago. In 2014, in the Hobby Lobby case, the Supreme Court held that corporations have religious liberty rights under a federal statute and entitled a chain of craft stores uh, uh, and a religious exemption to an Obamacare rule that required employers to cover birth control for uh, their employees. Uh, and just this past June, in a case involving a baker who refused to sell a wedding cake to a same-sex couple, the court held that a business corporation, Masterpiece Cake Shop Limited, had religious rights under the First Amendment. Indeed, today corporations have nearly all the same rights as you and me. And they use those rights to fight regulation of, the, of them and of business and of the economy. How did corporations come to have our most fundamental rights? Well, obviously, they don't march in the street with signs saying corporations are people, too. Um, but uh, corporations have been fighting for over 200 years in the United States Supreme Court to win expansive Supreme Court rulings recognizing their rights under the Constitution. In law school today, students are taught about civil rights, women's rights, LGBT rights, immigrants' rights, um, even states' rights. But I wish to suggest there's also been a long history and tradition in America of corporate rights. And uh, the story of how corporations won their rights is really quite remarkable. Now, the first thing you should know about the rights of corporations is that the Supreme Court has been dealing with this issue for a long time. The first Supreme Court case on the rights of African Americans, you may know Dred Scott, was decided in 1857. The first Supreme Court case on explicitly on the rights of women under the Constitution, Bradwell versus Illinois, in the 1870s. The first Supreme Court case explicitly to ask, are corporations covered by the Constitution, by contrast, was decided a half century earlier than these cases, all the way back in 1809. The corporation involved in that case was the Bank of the United States, the richest and most powerful corporation in America. It had branches from Boston to New Orleans at a time when most corporations were very highly localized entities. And the heated debate over the controversial bank among the founding fathers is famous for giving rise to the two competing political parties, right? as Hamilton and Jefferson uh, split over the issue of the national bank. So it gave us the two competing political parties, as well as a memorable rap battle in Hamilton the musical, if you remember that one. Um, and the bank was so despised by Jeffersonians that Jefferson's allies in Georgia passed a law imposing a tax on the Savannah branch of 
the Bank of the United States. Um, Jeffersonians, a little bit like today's opponents of Obamacare, were determined to kill the bank by any means necessary. The bank's case presented a familiar question. Are corporations people? Or more specifically in this case, are corporations citizens under Article III of the Constitution? That provision effectively provides citizens with a right to sue in federal court when they sue citizens of other states. And as many of you know, this constitutional provision was part of the way the, so the result of the framers' fear that, um, that state courts would be sort of beholden to parochial and local interests. And they might, not, uh, they might not treat out of staters very fairly. So you had a right, if you were going to sue someone from another state, uh, to go uh, to federal court. And the bank headquartered in Philadelphia claimed that it too would be prejudiced if forced to, to uh, fight Georgia's tax in Georgia state courts when the tax was very popular among Georgians. Yet even though there was no evidence that the framers of the Constitution wrote Article III to protect business corporations, um, the Supreme Court, in an opinion by the legendary Chief Justice John Marshall, held that the Bank of the United States did have the right to sue in federal court under Article III of the Constitution. Interestingly, Marshall did not say that corporations were citizens as such, even though the language of the provision were only guaranteed that right to citizens. Marshall said that corporations had the right to sue in federal court because their members were citizens. The people who formed the corporation were citizens. Even though the bank's lawsuit was brought in the name of the corporation to recover the property that belonged to the corporation, Marshall said that, quote, uh, Marshall said, quote, essentially the parties in such a case are the members of the corporation. The first Supreme Court decision to extend a constitutional right to corporations, Bank of the United States versus DeVoe, is one of the neglected landmarks of American law. You won't find it in any constitutional law textbook used here at the Stanford Law School or um, UCLA Law School where I teach. Um, yet it laid the foundation for two centuries of corporate rights cases to come. And by the way, the right to sue in federal court, lest you think that's an insignificant right, the right to sue in federal court under Article III, that was the same exact right that was involved in the Dred Scott case. The Supreme Court in that case held that Dred Scott, because he was black, could not be a citizen under Article III of the Constitution. The same provision that the court had a half century earlier said corporations could be protected by. Unlike racial minorities, corporations did have rights the white man was bound to respect. After the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was adopted to overturn the Dred Scott case and to guarantee the equal rights of African Americans. Yet in a remarkable series of cases in the 1880s, the Southern Pacific Railroad uh, Corporation fought to extend the 14th Amendment's guarantees to business corporations. And the railroad, known for its ruthfulness in politics, was willing to use any means necessary to get them. When California in 1879 passed a law, passed a constitution, it was a constitutional provision, adopted a constitutional provision imposing a special tax on railroad property, the Southern California Railroad, uh, sorry, the Southern Pacific Railroad assembled an all-star team of lawyers to fight back. Now, lawyers have played a starring role in all the great civil rights movements. We think of Thurgood Marshall in civil rights or Ruth Bader Ginsburg in, in women's rights. Um, any movement that seeks to secure rights through landmark Supreme Court cases must have good lawyers to devise the legal theories, hello, um, to persuade the justices, um, and, and corporate rights are no exception. It's only appropriate that uh, we talk about corporate rights. Well, I'll get into that later. Um, uh, but, uh, but lawyers played a starring role in this movement, too. Among those who, lawyers who argued for the rights of corporations in the Supreme Court uh, over uh, the many years uh, included Daniel Webster, one of the greatest advocates in Supreme Court history, who argued more than 200 cases back in the early 1800s when many of the provisions of the Constitution were first being interpreted. Uh, John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, 
argued for the rights of corporations. Uh, and in more recent years, uh, Ted Olson, the dean of today's elite Supreme Court bar, uh, has argued uh, for, uh, in Supreme Court cases, for the rights of corporations. Unlike traditional civil rights organizations, corporations have always had the resources to hire the best, most experienced lawyers uh, in the country. To try to overturn the California uh, law, uh, railroad tax law, the Southern Pacific's legal dream team uh, included uh, a former chief justice of the California Supreme Court, uh, one of the nation's leading law professors, and a former candidate for the presidential nomination. Yet even among these notables, Roscoe Conkling, the Southern Pacific's lead lawyer, stood out. Conkling had been for two decades a leader of the Republican Party in Washington at a time when the Republican Party dominated Washington after the Civil War. He had been nominated and confirmed to the United States Supreme Court himself. The most recent time he had been confirmed just months before he argued in the Southern Pacific Railroad case um, uh, for the rights of business corporations. He is the last person, by the way, to turn down a Supreme Court seat after having won confirmation. Um, and he turned down the seat in this case. Uh, he openly admitted his reasons were financial. He was simply making too much money as a lawyer for the Southern Pacific Railroad. Now, the Southern Pacific Railroad's lawyers first settled on a strategy of civil disobedience. They would refuse to pay the tax. And then, a half century before the NAACP's famous campaign against racial segregation, the Southern Pacific Railroad launched a remarkable series of what its lawyers called test cases, more than 60 of them in all, challenging uh, California's tax and seeking to expand the rights of business corporations. The railroad's litigation campaign, like that of the NAACP decades later, focused on the 14th Amendment to the Constitution and the Equal Protection Clause. It says, no state shall deny to any person equal uh, within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. This provision, as many of you know, was added to the Constitution after the Civil War to guarantee the rights of the newly freed slaves. But Conkling argued that it was also written to protect the rights of business corporations. Indeed, the day the Supreme Court heard the Southern Pacific's case in 1882, December, a newspaper headline captured what was at stake, civil rights of corporations. Now, the text of the 14th Amendment did not appear to grant corporations any rights whatsoever. It guaranteed the rights of persons. But if there's one thing you should know about Conkling is that he wouldn't let a little thing like the text of the Constitution get in his way. Um, and Conkling told the justices that earlier drafts of the 14th Amendment had originally guaranteed equal protection to, quote, citizens, but that the language had been changed specifically to persons to include business corporations, which for many legal purposes are deemed to be persons under the law. It was an audacious argument, but Conkling was uniquely situated to make it. As a young congressman, Roscoe Conkling had sat on the very committee that had written and drafted the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. <laughs> so when he was referring to the intent of the framers of the 14th Amendment, he was testifying to his own experience and his own intent. Indeed, uh, by the time uh, the Supreme Court heard the case, uh, the argument in the Southern Pacific Railroad case, Conkling was the last surviving member of the committee. Conkling even produced uh, a musty old journal that he said was a never-before-published record of the deliberations of the drafting committee. And that although no one had ever seen this journal before, he said it supported his argument about uh, the framing of the 14th Amendment. Now, there was one small problem with Roscoe Conkling's account of the history of the 14th Amendment, which was that it just wasn't true. <laughs> We now know that the language of the amendment had never been changed from citizen to person, the way Conkling argued. And nor did the records show that any member of the committee, many of whom were lawyers who engaged in private practice, ever mentioned uh, that uh, during the ratification debates that corporations were to be protected, and never themselves, when they were lawyers afterwards, uh, sought to use the 14th Amendment to expand the rights uh, of business corporations, not until Conkling. As one historian who examined the evidence closely concluded, the trusted Conkling had engaged in a, quote, 
deliberate brazen forgery to win new rights for corporations. Now, the Supreme Court never ruled in Roscoe Conkling's case, holding on to it for three years without ever issuing a decision. Some thought that it was due to a procedural snafu. I suspect that Conkling's fraud was uncovered. Um, regardless, another one of the Southern Pacific's 60 test cases came before the Supreme Court a couple years later, making the exact same arguments, but with no Conkling, no mention of his journal, and not relying on the history of the drafting of the 14th Amendment, suggesting that perhaps the lawyers no longer wanted to rely on that evidence. Um, and, but, and in the second case that arose a few years later, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Southern Pacific Railroad Company, although not on constitutional grounds. The Supreme Court specifically said we can decide this on the basis of some statutory issues, and we're not going to rule on the constitutional issue raised by the courts uh, and the arguments below. But then the Southern Pacific Railroad's test cases took another bizarre turn. The court's opinions, oh, here's the Southern Pacific Railroad. The court's opinions are published, as many of you know, in uh, official volumes known as the United States Reports. And these are edited and put together by someone known as the Reporter of Decisions. And the Reporter of Decisions um, typically uh, puts together a syllabus or summary of the opinion and publishes it in the official volumes right in front of the opinion. And this is designed to make legal research easier. People can sort of glance at this, figure out what the Supreme Court said before diving into the larger opinion. The Supreme Court's reporter back in the 1880s was a man named J.C. Bancroft Davis. And Davis's summary of the Southern Pacific Railroad's case said that the court had ruled that the defendant corporations are persons within the intent of the clause in the 14th Amendment, which for forbids a state to deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, we don't know what motivated Bancroft Davis to include in his summary a statement that the court had decided something that the opinion of the court itself says, we are specifically not deciding this question. <laughs> but if you're someone who loves conspiracy theories, it's worthwhile to note that uh, Bancroft Davis was the former president of the Newburgh and New York Railway Company. <laughs> justice Stephen Field was a justice who saw the opportunity presented by uh, Bancroft Davis's faulty head note. Field, if you're not familiar with him, was one of the most colorful men ever to be on the United States Supreme Court. He was the first Supreme Court justice appointed from California, from the Wild West. And uh, as is a befitting of a Wild West kind of guy, uh, he was rumored uh, to carry a gun beneath his robes at all time. Um, and he is the only sitting justice uh, who was ever arrested for a crime. And the crime was murder. Now, of course, he's a Supreme Court justice. Of course, he was innocent of murder. He didn't kill anybody. Um, but if we could say one thing, if he was guilty of one thing, it would be that he was willing, uh, uh, he was desperate to expand the rights of business corporations under the 14th Amendment. Um, and when the Southern Pacific Railroad's second case was handed down, remember the one where the court said, we're not deciding the constitutional issue? He writes his own opinion in that case, saying, castigating his colleagues, criticizing them for failing to reach the important constitutional issues that the business people of America deserve to know whether their rights were protected by the Constitution, he said. Yet, when he gets a chance to write a majority opinion a couple years later, Field just drops in a sentence in a case that is on a different topic that he says, well, as we held in the Southern Pacific Railroad case, uh, corporations are protected by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution something the court had not said, and that he had complained about the fact that the court had not said. But, uh, and in the years to follow, the Southern Pacific's case would be cited over and over and over again for holding that corporations are protected by the 14th Amendment. Now, one reason Field was able to get away with his sleight of hand was that he nevertheless captured the mood of a court that was entering into a period in its history known as the Lochner era. You know, a period roughly from 1890 to 1937, where the court became very well known for reading the Constitution broadly to protect business uh, and to restrict the ability of government to regulate businesses. Um, uh, the court during this period read the Constitution broadly enough to strike down things like 
um, maximum hour laws, uh, uh, some zoning laws, certain kinds of child labor laws, federal child labor laws. Um, Meanwhile, in cases like Plessy against Ferguson, the same Supreme Court refused to read the 14th Amendment broadly to protect the rights of African Americans, upholding separate but equal and Jim Crow apartheid in America. Indeed, in 1913, in what may be the first quantitative study of Supreme Court cases, a law librarian collected every 14th Amendment case that had been decided by the Supreme Court in the 44 years since the 14th Amendment had been ratified in 1868. And he found that during that time, the Supreme Court had decided a total of 28 cases on the rights of African Americans under the 14th Amendment. And during that same time, the court had ruled on 312 cases on the 14th Amendment rights of business corporations. The 14th Amendment, adopted as a shield to protect the rights of African Americans, had been transformed into a sword used by businesses to fight back against regulation. Now, while the Lochner era Supreme Court was quite business friendly, uh, the justices of that era also imposed new boundaries and limits on the rights of corporations. In a 1905 case, the Supreme Court held that corporations had property rights under the Constitution, but not liberty rights under the Constitution. Corporations needed basic protections for their property, for their assets, but the courts refused to extend to corporations rights that were associated with personal autonomy, bodily integrity, or personal uh, or political freedom. In a case evocative of recent controversies over businesses like uh, the wedding cake businesses that refused to provide services to same-sex couples, the Supreme Court in 1907 held that a corporation did not have a constitutional right to refuse service to unwanted customers. This is a case that arises here out of Northern California. The corporation that ran Tanfrin Racetrack, uh, later home of the legendary Seabiscuit, challenged a California law that required places of public, amu uh, of public, sorry, places of public amusement to admit anyone with a valid ticket. And uh, the corporation uh, challenged that law, claiming it violated the corporation's freedom of association, calling, it, calling the law the equivalent of forcing um, uh, a private, uh, into a private reception uh, someone that the host does not wish to have. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court upheld the law, calling the asserted right a liberty right. The court said this was not the type of right that a corporation uh, could enjoy. In another instance of deja vu, corporations like the Lansing Brewing Company challenged a campaign finance law limiting corporate money in elections nearly a century before Citizens United. In the early 1900s, some of the very first campaign finance laws were adopted. There were restrictions on corporate money in elections. And in the run-up to prohibition, the Lansing Brewing Company wanted to influence local elections on whether to go dry or not. And they wanted to spend money on election ads. And these laws prevented them from doing so. And they challenged the constitutionality of these laws. Yet the courts consistently upheld the campaign finance restrictions, explaining that the right to influence election was limited to natural persons, not artificial persons. The boundary between property rights and liberty rights that was created by the Lochner Court was blurred by the progressive jurisprudence of the mid-20th century. And it began with the First Amendment. The story of how corporations won First Amendment rights highlights how corporations have surprisingly been innovators in the field of constitutional law. Driven by the same pursuit of profit that leads businesses to be at the vanguard of the economy, corporations have also been first movers in constitutional law. And they played an influential role in shaping and in the evolution of some of our most important rights. In the early 20th century, when the Supreme Court first began to strike down laws for violating the freedom of the press under the First Amendment, some of the earliest and most important cases involved business corporations such as the newspaper companies that fought back against the kingfish, uh, Huey Long, Louisiana's uh, demagogic governor in the 1930s. If you're not familiar with Huey Long, he was kind of like Trump before Trump. He was 
uh, elected on the eve of the Great Depression, um, promising to make Louisiana great again. And when the media uh, of Louisiana opposed his policies, he accused them of publishing fake news. You can't make this stuff up. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Long uh, accused the papers of lying, and Long's forces adopted a law in Louisiana that imposed a tax on the advertising revenue of large circulation newspapers. Long said his tax should be called, quote, a tax on lying, two cents per lie. Now, the newspaper companies challenged Long's tax in court, but the law appeared to be on Long's side. The Supreme Court had previously said that the freedom of the press only prohibited government from stopping publication in advance. The advertising uh, tax, however, was not a prior restraint, and the newspaper companies weren't really prohibited from publishing anything. The Supreme Court, nevertheless, issued a landmark ruling in favor of the newspaper corporations. And the court held that the freedom of the press protected against any form of censorship, even if it was not a prior restraint. And corporations were entitled to claim that right, too. In a modern society, newspapers played an essential role in checking the government. Think of The Post uh, uh, and this uh, popular movie about the Washington Post checking the government by publishing the Pentagon Papers. Um, uh, and newspapers are published by business corporations. Indeed, if you liked the movie The Post and were cheering at the end, you were probably cheering at the end for a business corporation that was asserting its First Amendment rights. Indeed, in the years to follow, corporations would be involved in many other landmark freedom of the press cases, including New York Times Company versus Sullivan, uh, which established the right to criticize public officials, um, and, and uh, of course, the Pentagon Papers case. The First Amendment rights of corporations expanded greatly in the 1970s, and surprisingly, Ralph Nader deserves a fair share of the credit. The famed crusader for consumer rights won a groundbreaking Supreme Court case in the 1970s that struck down a law prohibiting pharmacists from advertising the price of prescription drugs. Now, Nader's goal was to help consumers who were often overcharged for the prescription medication. And because of this restriction on advertising, they couldn't comparison shop very easily. Right? And so Nader wanted to free up uh, that information for consumers. But Nader's victory established two First Amendment principles that have since been used to greater success by business corporations than by consumers. The first principle was that speech on commercial matters, like advertising, was protected by the First Amendment. Previously, the court had rejected the argument that advertising and commercial speech was protected uh, by the First Amendment at all. But Nader's new doctrine empowered corporations to challenge a wide range of laws, including laws mandating graphic warnings on cigarette labels, or laws requiring public companies to disclose uh, to investors the use of conflict minerals, uh, and laws restricting the advertising of alcohol and gaming. Thanks to the commercial speech doctrine, today about 50% of all First Amendment cases brought in the federal courts are brought by business corporations or the trade associations that represent business. Recently, the head of Nader's public interest organization called for the entire line of commercial speech cases that came out of Ralph Nader's victory to be overturned. A poignant example, perhaps, of constitutional buyer's regret. The second principle established by Nader's victory was that the First Amendment protected the rights of listeners without regard to the identity of the, of the speaker and without regard to whether that speaker had any right to speak at all. Nader represented consumers in his case, right? He was a consumer advocate. He wasn't defending pharmacists, right? So his case didn't have any pharmacists. But in his case, really, the consumers, their speech wasn't limited, right? They weren't prohibited from advertising uh, prices. It was a restriction on the pharmacist's speech. So to win his case, uh, Nader made uh, uh, an innovative argument that the First Amendment also protected the rights of listeners, the rights of the consumers to hear what the pharmacist would have to say, regardless of whether the pharmacist had any right to speak those words. This became known as the listener's rights view of the First Amendment. And that theory would quickly be used to strike down laws restricting corporate money in elections. 30 years before Citizens United, the, free, the Supreme Court first struck down a campaign finance law limiting corporate spending in uh, elections in a case called First National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti. Uh, 
The case involved a Massachusetts law that prohibited corporations from spending money to influence ballot measure campaigns. The majority opinion for the divided 5-4 court was written by Lewis Powell, Jr. Just prior to joining the court in 1971, Powell wrote a memorandum for the Chamber of Commerce outlining a program for the political mobilization of business. It was the era of Nader. Consumer rights were, uh, were at the top of uh, everyone's agenda. There was a lot of lawmaking uh, happening. Businesses felt like they were under attack. Uh, and Powell wrote a memo uh, called The Attack on the Free Enterprise System to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and Powell's memo was a call to arms for businesses to organize, to get political, to fight back against Nader and the consumer rights movement. Powell's memorandum was widely shared, and today historians accredit the memorandum with inspiring businessmen to become much more, or businesses generally, to become much more politically active. In the Bilotti case, Powell, now a justice on the Supreme Court, had the opportunity to turn his memorandum into constitutional doctrine. Yet in the conference after the case, the conference where the justices meet to decide and how they're going and cast their initial votes, um, the justices after, the, after that conference occurred, Powell saw the majority in the case start to slip away. Because when the court first decided to rule on the case, they said, well, we should strike down this Massachusetts law, but not say anything about the rights of business corporations. Well, Powell thought that was the wrong way to go. Uh, and as the court continued to consider the case, and as Justice Brennan started drafting the opinion, Justice Brennan threw up his hands and says, I don't think we can decide this case without reaching the issues of the rights of corporations. And he said, if we reach that issue, I don't want to write the majority. I want to write the dissent, because I don't believe in the rights of corporations. And justices started peeling off to join Brennan, first Marshall, then Rehnquist, and White. And it looked like Powell's majority was going uh, to lose. And so Powell, even though in his personal notes on the case, said, uh, this is not about listeners' rights. This is about the rights of corporations. When he writes the opinion to keep Justice Blackmun's vote, he adopts the theory that Justice Blackmun had articulated in the Ralph Nader case. Blackman had been the one who had written the opinion in Ralph Nader's case. And so he takes a listener's rights approach to uh, the issue and saying that, in his opinion, uh, that asking whether business corporations have political speech rights is the wrong question. He said the only question is whether this interferes with the rights of listeners the rights of people to hear what corporations would have to say. The identity and the rights of the speaker, Powell said, were irrelevant. Listeners' rights, by the way, would also be used in Citizens United. The 2010 decision written by Justice Kennedy, which struck down a law barring corporations from spending their money on a certain election ads, uh, Justice Kennedy's opinion for the court said that the identity of the speaker was irrelevant. All that mattered was whether the law restricted speech that was protected. Uh, and entitled to protection for the listeners. Now, one of the most unexpected things about the history of the corporate rights movement is the role of corporate personhood. Right? Many people blame corporate personhood for these expansive constitutional rulings uh, in favor of corporations and for decisions like Citizens United. So what is corporate personhood? Although controversial today, corporate personhood is actually a very well-established legal principle. Go back all the way to 1757, and Blackstone, in his influential commentaries on the laws of England, wrote that corporations were, quote, artificial persons. Indeed, if you open up any introductory textbook on corporate law today, one of the very first lessons will be that corporations are, quote, fictional but legally recognized entities or persons that are treated as having some of the same attributes as natural persons. Now, to say that corporations are people is not to make an existential claim that corporations are exactly the same as you and me. Corporate personhood simply means that corporation, a corporation has its own independent identity in the eyes of the law. The corporate entity is wholly separate in its rights and duties from the people who make it up. Indeed, Delaware Chief Justice Leo Strine, one of the nation's leading experts on corporate law, says, quote, the whole point of corporate law is that a corporation is a distinct entity that is legally separate from its stockholders, managers, and creditors. That's what distinguishes a corporation from a partnership. And that's why if you slip and fall in a Starbucks, you have to sue the company Starbucks. You can't sue the individual investors. The shareholders have limited liability because Starbucks and its investors are separate legal persons with separate legal rights and separate legal duties. Yet, understood in this way, 
the Supreme Court has usually ignored corporate personhood in corporate rights cases. We recall Chief Justice John Marshall's opinion in the first corporate rights case in 1809. He said it wasn't that corporations were citizens, it's that corporation, the members of the corporation were citizens. Justice Sam Alito's opinion in the Hobby Lobby case takes the same approach, saying that the birth control requirement at issue there burdened the religious liberty rights of the Hobby Lobby's owners, the Green family. In these cases, the Supreme Court's rejecting the core tenet of corporate personhood, the idea that a corporation has its own legal rights and duties that are separate and distinct from the rights and duties of its members. Indeed, if you think about it, if a corporation's rights are derived directly from its members, well, no surprise that corporations have nearly all the same rights as people, because their members are usually people. Now, over the years, the Supreme Court has occasionally treated the corporation as its own independent legal entity, that is to say, as a person. The surprising thing is that when the court has been explicit in adopting corporate personhood, in many cases it's resulted in the Supreme Court restricting or limiting the rights of corporations, giving corporations fewer rights than ordinary individuals. In 1839, for example, the Supreme Court refused to extend the guarantees of the Privileges and Immunities Clause of Article 4 to corporations. This provision basically means that if you move from one state to another, you're entitled to all the same legal rights as the locals uh, of the state to which you've moved. Right? And corporations that were seeking to operate in the growing national economy of the early 1800s tried to use this provision to strike down protectionist state laws that said, hey, if you're an out-of-state corporation wanting to do business here, you have to pay this special bond, have the special insurance requirement, have other special um, uh, duties. The corporation said that, well, since their members were citizens who were entitled to go to any state and do business on the same terms as locals, the corporation should be able to go to any state and make contracts and do business just like locals. The Supreme Court at the time was led by Roger Tawney, and he ruled against the corporations. Although reviled today for his opinion in Dred Scott, Tawney had one thing that today's opponents of Citizens United might appreciate, which was that he was a corporate reformer who was opposed to expansive rights for business corporations. According to Tawney, a corporation is, quote, a person for certain purposes. When a corporation makes a contract, it is the contract of the legal entity, the artificial being created by the charter, and not the contract of the individual members, he said. In Tawney's view, the rights and duties of the corporate entity were distinct and separate, wholly separate and distinct from the rights and duties of the members. The Supreme Court did something similar in the early 1900s in a case arising out of Teddy Roosevelt's uh, famous effort to break up the trusts. Roosevelt launched a criminal investigation of the Tobacco Trust and subpoenaed the officers of the American Tobacco Company uh, to come testify before the grand jury. And the corporation went to court claiming it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment right of self-incrimination to have the company's own officers testify against the company before the grand jury. The Supreme Court rejected their claim, saying it was not self-incrimination because the, the company and the officers of the company were separate legal persons with separate legal rights and separate legal duties. Fueled by the capital amassed with the corporate form and represented by the bar's highest paid lawyers, corporations have been fighting for equal rights uh, for more than two centuries. They have used the courts and the Constitution to strike down business regulation and to secure their freedom in the marketplace. But they've also been constitutional first movers and innovators, helping to breathe life into important constitutional provisions like the freedom of the press. Um, and contrary to popular opinion, corporate, person put, corporate personhood has not been the basis for expansive corporate rights. And when it has been used, has often been used actually to limit the rights of corporations. Citizens United and Hobby Lobby have brought the issue of corporate rights to public attention. But I wish to suggest tonight that they really are only the most recent chapters in a much longer story, the story of the corporate rights movement, arguably one of the most successful yet least known civil rights movements in American history. Thank you. If you're a student, I'll give you preference. <laughs>
<laughs> First of all, sorry I was late. That's good. Um, so the opinion you refer to uh, rejecting the privileges and immunities rights of corporations gives no explanation. There's, there's no rationale. It just is an assertion. And the privileges and immunities clause we know was designed to produce a, a, a common market, a free, a, the free movement of goods and services across uh, state boundaries. So if the United States is not you know, a bunch of foreign countries with different economies, but a united economy, do you think that decision was correctly decided? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so first of all, the decision certainly uh, does not capture the current law with regards to states' ability to put up protectionist laws. And one of the interesting things I've, uh, I found in writing the book is that corporations led basically a 100-year effort to fight back against these protectionist state laws using every constitutional provision they could get their hands on to do it. So they first, they bring these privileges or immunities claim, bringing that same kind of argument that we're trying to get a national marketplace, these should be open. But at the time, that wasn't the prevailing view of the privileges or immunities clause in quite that way, in part because the way in, in the early 1800s, the way you regulated a corporation was usually through its charter. Right? There wasn't a lot of business regulation, so to speak. You regulated mostly through a charter. Um, and the only state that would have influence over a, state, of a corporation's charter was its state of incorporation. So any other state it wanted to do business in, those states very, had a lot of, didn't have a lot of leeway to regulate those corporations very easily. So one of the things they did, they said, if you want to come operate here, we want to have some protections for our consumers. You have to have these special bonding requirements, insurance requirements, et cetera. Corporations went against, used the Privileges and Immunities Clause. They lost on that. When uh, the 14th Amendment was adopted, then they decided to bring similar claims under the Due Process Clause uh, of the Constitution. That got turned away. They ended up going to the Commerce Clause uh, and ultimately winning under a Commerce Clause argument. Uh, and it's a really interesting story about sort of the, the die-hard effort that, uh, of corporations to, they really wanted to fight against this and they were going to continue to fight and make innovative arguments time after time after time until they could get one that stuck. And it took a long time for them to get one that stuck. But now we have the law that's basically, as you suggest, uh, not through the Privileges or Immunities Clause per se, um, but through uh, really through the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, and through other, other restrictions uh, and other uh, ways that the court has read the Constitution. Um, so uh, in some ways, it's uh, kind of it became uh, quickly irrelevant, uh, uh, the, the, the ruling of the court on the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Yeah, I, my understanding is that when Teddy Roosevelt was president, um, corporations had to be rechartered like every year or so uh, to keep them from getting out of control. Uh, what? Why did that stop? So it's actually not the case that corporations had to be rechartered every year. And in fact, what happened was is about. Uh, ten years before Roosevelt was elected in the 1890s, we saw a real push and a move among corporate laws of the various states to become more permissive and more liberal to allow the creation of holding companies, for instance, to allow corporations to incorporate for indefinitely without any uh, limitation on their duration, without restrictions on capitalization or anything like that, known as general incorporation laws. These are the laws that were put in place that ultimately allowed the rise and maintenance of the trusts, the big, powerful corporations that Roosevelt wanted eventually to take on. Um, but uh, Roosevelt did have a very aggressive reform uh, movement for corporations, um, including the creation of a, a federal incorporation, where corporations would have to be chartered uh, by a bureau of federal incorporation rather than by the state level. That would presumably give the federal government much more regulatory authority over those corporations than they can have uh, currently. Um, but it's interesting that Roosevelt was this trust buster because no presidential candidate probably ever in American history, no presidential campaign ever in American history relied more on corporate contributions than Teddy Roosevelt's 1904 campaign. And indeed, about 75% of his money came from big corporations. His campaign finance chair was a, a businessman who decided to apply his business techniques to fundraising and organized the most comprehensive, systematic taxation of business corporations to contribute to political politics than we had ever seen. 
Uh, companies like the Standard Oil had to give $250,000. He went and told them, you have to give us $250,000. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and indeed, the scandal over when he gets caught uh, a year later, when it comes out that he had t taken all this corporate money and yet he was this big trust buster, it led to a huge scandal that gave rise to the very first campaign finance laws. The first law is saying, hey, we've got to regulate money in elections. And the first thing we need to do is get corporate money out of elections. Campaign finance law was born, if you will, with the idea that we need to restrict corporate money in elections. So. Um, so you mentioned uh, in-house attorneys in the 19th century kind of doing impact litigation or uh, test cases. So I kind of have two questions. One, why did railroads uh, feel that they, should, they needed to take that upon themselves and absorb the cost um, as like individual entities to, to litigate for all their, their, their progeny as corporations? And uh, today do we just Today, do we see any of that, or is it mostly um, lobbying on the Hill, where we see uh, corporations exerting their, their influence on legislation? Or right. No, it's a great point. I mean, so one question, so why do corporations um, uh, pursue uh, rights that will benefit other corporations, not just themselves, right? There's a way in which there's a kind of, you know, for lack of like an identity there, kind of, in some way, that unites them, perhaps. I mean, I don't think they think of it in that way. That's not how corporate managers approach these questions. I think it's really about corporations largely being driven by self-interest, right? An idea that um, uh, that this tax imposes burdens on us, that the cost of fighting that tax is actually not that great for a big business corporation, right? We can fight, the cost of litigation is not a huge expense for a very wealthy corporation. Um, and the prospect of victory may be slim, but the rewards of victory are great uh, in terms of profit. Um, and even if they lose, Corporations in the test cases were an evidence of this, where the lawyers thought, well, it's possible we might lose. This is a pretty innovative claim we're making that the 14th Amendment protects business corporations. But they thought that the very process of litigation would be a discouragement to more regulation, right? That it's going to cost the state so much. So part of it was about raising costs. I should say, by the way, that in the 20th century, that changes somewhat. And by the 1970s, you start seeing more organized groups that are thinking about litigation as a strategy, in part because of the Powell Memorandum. And that you have organizations like the Chamber of Commerce that becomes much more focused on a litigation campaign in a way that sort of looks more like what we I think of as a not a civil rights organization, but an organization that represents a lot of members that is now pursuing litigation impact litigation, if you will, to protect those members and the interests of those members and using the Constitution and constitutional rights as one vehicle to do it. Uh, so you do see uh, uh, quite a bit of that now. Question over here. Thanks. So you mentioned that uh, corporations received the right to appear in federal court before racial minorities, but then they received it through a congressional, or sorry, a constitutional amendment. Are there any cases where businesses got a civil right and then those were imputed to racial minorities without having to go through the whole amendment process? Um, you know, yes, maybe not so clearly in terms of racial minorities. I mean, if we want to think about um, equal protection rights, due process rights, if you want to think about those are like maybe the two of the most important rights in the Constitution under the 14th Amendment for the rights of vulnerable minorities, right? Equal protection, um, uh, from, you know, that strikes down discrimination, due process, it's been the basis for striking down uh, 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 laws banning interracial marriage and now laws banning uh, 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 same-sex marriage. Uh, so these two clauses, if you want to take, for instance, are the sort of the wellspring of so much of our civil rights litigation. If you, if you want uh, an, a history of those two provisions, would really have to feature corporate litigation quite prominently. Not exclusively, but quite prominently, right? So the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clauses, you know, they're read very narrowly by the court in the first 20 years after this 14th Amendment's adopted. It's only after the corporations start making these claims that the Due Process Clause is greatly expanded. And that's not just because corporations are making, but they're part of that underlying story. And we can look back through the history, uh, uh, some of the earliest contract clause cases in the early 1800s were brought by corporations. Um, uh, like I said, these due process uh, clause cases uh, and whatnot. Uh, if we look at the history of, so for instance, Fourth Amendment cases, some of the very first Fourth Amendment cases arguing that the federal government had violated the Fourth Amendment 
protections against unreasonable searches and seizures, those were businesses, corporations uh, that were fighting business subpoenas. Nah, and now those provisions are some of the most important provisions out there protecting, say, minorities on the street from being uh, stop and frisk, you know, those kinds of policies. So uh, there are ways in which corporations were definitely involved in, uh, influentially involved in the growth and expansion of certain rights that are now really fundamental to uh, the protection of minorities. Thank you. Hi, so uh, uh, and it's by strange coincidence, I, I finished your book last week, and, and it's excellent. Everyone should buy it. I'm not just saying that because you're here. Uh, Thank you. It's, it's even more fascinating and weirder. Uh, Thank you to my brother for coming here today. Thank you. <laughs> for the highlights. Uh, so at the risk of making the sort of review book review comment of why didn't you write the book I wanted you to write, um, the one thing I was sort of left wanting at the end of your book, uh, just really curious to know, is what do you really think is on sort of is what you know? What's on the yes? I think corporations should possess these constitutional rights. Right. What's on the other side? What's a bridge too far? People I always want more, right? right? So, well, that's an interesting thing. So, when, and as originally drafted, this book, the last chapter had a whole normative section, like this is how we should think about this going forward. And my editor saw it and said, "You've written a great history book. Why did you end it with this law professor nonsense? Like, get rid of it." He's like. Yeah, he's like, get rid of that stuff. Cut it all out. Um, so it had some. Uh, uh, and I do think that, I also think that uh, corporate rights, one thing I learned in writing this book is that it's a complicated story. And that uh, the knee-jerk reaction of either extreme is a mistake in this space. Right? The knee-jerk reaction that corporations should have all the same rights as people, I don't think any of us really believe that. Right? The corporations are not allowed to run for office. They don't have a right to vote. Right? We don't really think they should be exactly the same, have exactly the same rights as people. Um, and at, at the same time, I think the idea that corporations should have no rights under the Constitution is a serious mistake. So there's a big amendment effort right now to adopt a 28th Amendment led by organizations like Move to Amend and Common Cause and Free Speech for People. It's a very well-meaning um, uh, uh, reform movement, uh, the objectives of which I find myself in much agreement with. Um, but the strategy is a mistake. The idea of a, a constitutional provision that says, as theirs would, that corporations have no rights under the Constitution is a huge mistake. Number one, corporations need free speech rights somewhat. right? If the New York Times doesn't have free speech rights, if CNN doesn't have free speech rights, they're not going to do so well in this current political environment. Right? Uh, we want media corporations to have freedom of the speech, uh, freedom of speech, to be sure. Um, if corporations have no rights under the Constitution, they have no property rights. So if the government wants to, says, hey, get that campus that Google built, we really like that. We're going to take that. They could, because there's nothing in the Constitution that would require them to pay just compensation. Or the next time um, the FBI wants to force Apple to open an iPhone that they believe belonged to a terrorist suspect, um, Apple couldn't go to court saying this is a violation of our due process, because they wouldn't have any due process rights. Right? So I think that we need a nuanced approach to how we think about corporate rights. It's not all in, it's not all out. Um, and the reform movement to deny corporations all rights is a mistake. If you want to know how I think we should approach some of these questions, I think actually uh, there's an inkling. It's not the final answer, but I think it's a starting point in the Lochner era distinction between property rights for corporations and liberty rights for corporations. Like I said, I don't think that's the end point, but I think that's a starting point. It provides a kind of presumption of how we might think about rights. Um, uh, but there we go. Like I say, it's complicated. Now you know why the editor is like, get rid of this nonsense. <laughs> It's just going to confuse people. If you're interested in the normative arguments, there's a very good book that's been written that I think corresponds with a lot of my history. Uh, it just came out recently by a professor named Kent Greenfield called Corporations Are People, and They Should Act Like It, Too. <laughs> um, I'm going to branch off a little bit. You've been talking about the rights of speech because of the listeners. That's the current justification, right? How does that not apply to Russia? Because if, if our theory is correct, they might have talked. Why isn't that a, a slam dunk that that's not a crime? 
Right. Well, there's two ways to think about it. So I'm not sure when you say Russia, it depends on what Russia is saying, right? So if Russia is taking out ads in uh, uh, the newspaper on basic political issues, but not taking a stand in favor or against any particular candidate, there probably would have that probably would be protected by the court um, even today. The real question, right? If the real question is what uh, could Russia make electioneering statements, sta uh, expressions of support for or against a candidate? What the Supreme Court has generally said, we can regulate that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's a really interesting question. After Citizens United, the logic of Citizens United should say that restrictions on foreigners from spending money in American elections is unconstitutional because the identity of the speaker is irrelevant and all that matters is whether the listeners want to hear those or not want to but might benefit from hearing those ads. I should say though, in the wake of Citizens United, um, lower courts have upheld the restriction on foreigners contributing to candidates uh, and making independent expenditures. Um, and the Supreme Court has allowed those to stand. It's at least suggesting that, you know, that, uh, that, that the court didn't necessarily see th that to be an equivalent, um, uh, uh, that, that analogy to be persuasive. But they have decided, they've just allowed. They've just allowed. By the court reporter who did it wrong, yeah. mistake, either on purpose or not, when did that get known? When did that get found out? Um, when did it get found out? Uh, it became the subject of quite a bit of debate and discussion in the 1930s, actually. It became, what happened was, is Conkling's journal, right, the one that he said was the never before published journal, it turns out that that really was a never before published journal of the deliberations of the 14th Amendment Drafting Committee. It didn't support his argument about corporate rights, by the way, when you look at it, and I read it, you, you just don't see anything in there. But it was a real journal. And what happened was after the case, the journal disappears again. And it's found later, like in the 19, 19 teens or something like that. And it sparks renewed interest and controversy. And especially as progressives are criticizing the conservative Lochner Court of the 1900, they're looking back and saying, well, how did we get here? And this case becomes a real important one, where people start saying, hey, what happened here? Uh, and that's where the investigations were. The historian that I mentioned who looked into this case was um, a, a, a librarian, a deaf librarian by the name of Howard J. Graham, who um, ended up becoming um, such an expert on the 14th Amendment, writing about Roscoe Conkling, that he then later um, uh, became an advisor to the NAACP in the Brown litigation and helped write their brief in Brown versus Board of Education. Um, uh, so uh, an interesting linkage here between uh, the two. I should say that the court reporter, Bancroft Davis, was known for his bad summaries and <laughs> syllabuses. This was actually a subject of a lot of dispute among the justices. There were several cases where justices wrote memos to each other saying, this syllabus doesn't make any sense. We've got to get rid of this court reporter. Um, that he's not making, he's not doing anything. And like he would, he, was, he had bizarre ideas. He, had, he decided on his own to, in the back of one of the United States reports, to collect every Supreme Court case where the court had struck down a law for violating the Constitution. And it was bizarre. He left out Dred Scott, for instance, like the most famous case in American history where the court strikes down a law on the basis of the Constitution. Uh, and other cases were included that weren't const it was, he was He was a bizarre guy, not very good at his job, and the justices didn't like him for it. Well, you could say it gives discredit to the law. I mean, the truth is, is, you know, the court has 312 cases after that where it rules on the rights of business corporations in the next 25 years. They do, but what happens is, is then the justices over time adopt that principle and it becomes part of settled law because it then becomes repeated and held in cases where you do have a legitimate justice. But it's interesting that the rights of corporations under the 14th Amendment, a pretty important constitutional principle, has never been the subject of a justified opinion by the Supreme Court. The opinion majority has never set out to justify uh, and provide any reasoned argument for why corporations should have rights under the 14th Amendment. You could make a reason. I'm not saying they couldn't make it. That's never appeared in the United States reports, uh, at least for the 14th Amendment rights. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the, the strategy the attorneys of corporations used over time. Like, was it just sort of a shotgun approach of we're going to try as many amendments as possible to see if any of them stick? Or was there a more sort of 
planned out strategy in terms of we think these amendments or these rights are going to be more likely to work in our favor as opposed to these other ones? Well, I'm sure the lawyers to any particular case are thinking which, which amendments are going to be possible in this space and which amendments are not going to be possible. So that is always part of the litigation strategy. But there's not like, um, I don't think it's of the same, it's not the same kind of litigation strategy and campaign as the NAACP exactly, right? Where they think we need to buy, get rid of separate but equal and we're gonna have a 30 year campaign to get rid of this one key doctrine that's holding us down. It's not quite that, right? But you do have things that are kind of similar. Like I mentioned earlier, the fight against these protection of state laws where it's different corporations, not one organization throughout all those hundred years, but one after another, they all see that this is a problem and there's these companies, that the underlying pressures, they don't disappear, right? Those protectionist laws are there, they're restricting corporations, and so the next one comes in and says, hey, we're gonna fight against this too. Um, so there is a lot of innovation, but uh, I think like a lot of constitutional litigation, it is, we've got a problem, we wanna solve it, what, what tools can we use to solve it? And if it's that clause of the Constitution, we'll use that one. If it's that clause, we'll use that one. I think that's really what about, not so much of, you know, we need to spend 50 years trying to invigorate the dormant commerce clause or something like that. We have time for one more brief question. It's not the questions that are long, it's the answer. <laughs> uh, I'm looking for reconciliation for a couple of things. One thing you just said, which is, there isn't any opinion that says the 14th Amendment applies to corporations. Did I understand that correctly? Sorry, there's no opinion that offers a reasoned justification of that holding. There are subsequent opinions that say corporations have 14th Amendment rights, citing these cases, citing the cases that rely on the cases, you know, build its turtles all the way down, but you're citing a turtle along the way. But never that what we think of as signature of a judicial opinion is reason justification for a ruling that we don't have. It's a complex web, isn't it? But how can we reconcile that with the statistics you put up in a chart there that were pretty stunning in my estimation, which said that around the turn of the century, some historian had looked into the cases that were, were brought, and it was like 30 to 300 in favor of corporations versus uh, uh, African Americans. Yeah. And, and so, what do you make of that? I, and if you look through these cases, you look in vain for the reason justification. Instead, what it is is, oh, we've already held this. We held this in this case. Oh, and then, uh, then, Justice, then they cite Justice Field's opinion, where he says we cited it because now it's in another Supreme Court opinion. So you get a lot of this without, uh, like I say, it's turtles all the way down without actually providing a real justification. Um, and by the way, I think that there could be justifications. It's not that you can't provide an argument. And indeed, one of the surprising things is, um, is that this ruling has never been seriously questioned by the Supreme Court in the years since. There's really only been one, maybe two justices on the Supreme Court since who have argued for reversing the 14th Amendment rulings in favor of corporations. Uh, Hugo Black did it um, uh, audaciously. He was only four months onto the Supreme Court and had not been a judge before that. I mean, he, maybe early in his career he had been a, a justice of the peace kind of thing. Uh, but he had never been a judge ruling on these kinds of issues. And four months into his time on the Supreme Court, he issues a very lengthy opinion, uh, a dissenting opinion, saying, hey, we need to overturn this. Roscoe Conkling lied. We need to uh, reshape this uh, and get this right. Um, and, you know, basically, um, uh, over the years, he's called an eccentric exception by Felix Frankfurter for his unusual views of the 14th Amendment. Well, William O. Douglas was another one who called into question um, the idea of 14th Amendment rights for corporations. Yeah. A story that's to be continued. Please join me in thanking uh, Professor Thank Richard. Thanks so much. So thank you, that was great. I only regret that I missed the first minute or two. That was fantastic. Um, so uh, you've, been, you've been thanked, but pre I, let me add my personal appreciation for your coming all the way up uh, uh, to deliver this. And uh, I didn't get to welcome everyone, but I'll be able to say goodbye to everyone <laughs> and, uh, and encourage you to come to the next Constitutional Conversation, which yeah, will be... Uh, and which one is this? With Jonathan Gannett. Uh, oh, so this is going to be a very interesting, uh, there's going to be a panel on Jonathan Gannett's new book, uh, 
uh, called uh, uh, Fixing the Constitution. And it's about the really interesting question of, you know, our Constitution was the first written Constitution for a nation. And when it came out, really people didn't even know what a Constitution was. How do we even think about what this document is? What are we doing in a constitutional republic? And so this book is about how in the first 10 years uh, of the republic, uh, uh, people sort of figured out uh, what constitutionalism is all about. And, and uh, we're uh, giving, the Constitutional Law Center is giving uh, the, the book uh, our uh, Publius Award and inviting uh, three folks to, uh, so Jonathan will speak about the book and then there'll be three uh, uh, folks uh, uh, giving commentaries on it. So please, that's J uh, January 29th. Uh, look forward to seeing you then. And let me just, uh, let's again thank. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.